That was a fantastic talk from Alex, but we're moving on now for a talk with Johan so Olufsen of Gothenburg Mega Games. He was a long time organizer and runner alongside designing his own games with Event Horizon and his own adaptations of Watch the Skies, which have been most recently run twice fantastically online, once in December and once at Megacon. His talk today is looking about how he managed to create that tension of economies between nations in those previous two runs and how to keep it both fun and balanced to create that necessary tension between countries and players. So, without further ado, Johan. Tall very much. Um, happy to be here um, presenting second year in a row. Uh, I just watched my um, last year's presentation leading up to this, so I, I'm not contradicting myself. I don't, I don't think I am. Um, I said in that talk that Watch the Skies would be a good game for online. Turned out I was right, so um, that's the only key takeaway between these two talks, I think. Um, I'm going to do this as as the sort of classical TED talk and, and pose a, a um, starting question. And that starting uh, question is basically this. Oh. Why isn't uh, this a bigger part of Watch the Skies? And what is this? This is the sort of trade war and at the start of um, Trump's presidency going to absolutely um, sort of balls to the wall trade war with, with China. And I thought it was really interesting watching that uh, through the news and, and um, just started, started me thinking what mechanical um, things do we have in what's disguise to be able to do this sort of stuff, which is basically take on uh, large economies. Uh, and maybe this picture doesn't do it justice from a sort of watch the skies as we know it perspective, but rather this. Why isn't why isn't this in <laughs> watch the skies? Um, so I started by looking at uh, trading watch the skies uh, as it is described in the light version, which is which is the version that. Most people run, it's the sort of boxed version as well that uh, is being sold on um, uh, rock, paper, scissors. And basically this is the economy as described in uh, the rules for that game. So it's part of the treaties game mechanic uh, where you can do a bunch of different types of treaties. You can do defense treaties, um, you can do science treaties, you can do a bunch of stuff, and it's very sort of open-ended. Part of that is that you can agree to trade with a country, um, and trade treaties will create additional wealth of one uh, megabuck per turn for your country, and you can have up to two trade treaties at any one time. And that's in the head of state briefing for what this guy's liked. So, of course, I, I didn't, didn't set out to do this to break the original game. Uh, and I really wanted to do it sort of in the spirit of the game. So I sent over my design notes to Jim, um, and this is what he had to say about it. it sounds quite complicated with eight commodities. But I'm sure it isn't, and I'm interested to see how it works. Did you feel the game needed to be more difficult or challenging for the players? And I think my talk today is trying to answer Jim, which I've already done, obviously, because I'm not rude, but to because they are interesting questions. Um, and from my sort of design perspective going into this, um, and this is like trying to uh, deconstruct it uh, um, after the fact, uh, rather than going into this um, very sort of um, structured, like that this is going to look. But this, is, this was the mindset in the back of my mind. Um, I'm not a spreadsheets man like Alex uh, or Nicholas, who is my spreadsheets man. Um, 
but tr trying to find that sweet spot um, between different parts or important aspects of what I find to be interesting about me mega games and uh, mega game mechanics. And the first sweet spot is between time investment and complexity and interconnection between different parts of the game and complexity of the things you're trying to simulate. Um, and it goes from, from high complexity uh, to low complexity and um, either sort of very effective um, time management or something that is very time consuming. And for that, Watch the Sky Light uh, lands uh, nicely in the sort of low complexity and uh, low interconnectedness, uh, as you saw in, in the rules notes for Watch the Skies. And it is very effective. It takes very little time to do it. But also balancing um, goals and agency. And goals could either be pluralistic, so it's um, uh, interconnected with a bunch of other things in the game. Uh, or it could be a single goal, as in uh, Watch the Sky's Light, where it gives you money. And also agency, which is really important and also part of the title of this talk, uh, which where you can have low agency and uh, you can have high agency. And, and that is obviously a, a sliding scale. But um, we set out to do something that it had high complexity, but was very effective, meaning you didn't have to spend a bunch of time interacting with it uh, and have uh, pluralistic goals, which, give, which gives all players high agency. And for the first, like what Alex said about doing trial runs and, uh, and that, uh, the first time we ran it after modeling it a million times, this is where we ended up, which gives you uh, the price for the worst possible combination of a time-consuming mechanic with very low agency. Uh, and how did we end up there? And I'll walk you through the process. Um, rather than putting, uh, setting up your own spreadsheets, uh, why do that when Harvard University can do it for you? This is the American economy in 2018 as uh, far as imports are concerned. Um, as you can see, it consists of many different parts and has a very high complexity. This is a complexity that I set out to mirror in this mechanic. But as you can see, this is absolute madness to try and get into a mega game and especially for somebody to try and understand without having to sit through like a couple of years of Harvard. Um, then we have this, which is the interconnectedness of the economy, uh, the US economy, when it comes to a, a sort of global perspective. So um, to quote popular memes, this is how it started and uh, this is where it's going. So we started out with something that was insanely complex and complicated and time consuming. And we, we set out to, to make an abstraction of that that is understandable and easy to interact with. And how did it go wrong um, the first time we tried it out? Well, it was the time consuming part uh, that killed all the agency because players spent uh, a lot of time running around doing individual trade deals uh, and the economy started out as a blank slate and a bunch of bunch of different stuff that didn't make sense. So we set out to reduce the time consumption of the thing. Um, the world economy, as uh, I've just showed you, um, this view uh, from Harvard, abstracted down to something a lot more tangible, which shows you the type of commodity that the US needs to import to keep their economy running. Uh, each slot uh, has a, an effect, which means that with everything uh, in black showing, you get docked one income per turn. So this would actually, for the US not to import anything, 
uh, would absolutely kill their economy. It would give them a total of minus eight uh, income per turn, which is a huge amount of megabucks in, in Watch the Skies for those of you who played it. But also the uh, plus ones is a way of fleshing out that sort of initial trade deal of your two megabucks that you can make from making extra deals with somebody. And the the mistake that we made in the first run was, was uh, starting out from this. So reducing time consumption, since um, the economy doesn't start in a vacuum, um, it starts uh, at game start in a functioning world, a functioning world that looks something like this, uh, where the US has trade relations with different nations. So we slot the trade deals into where they're supposed to be at the start of the game based on the real world uh, situation. So you can see here that the chemical, the, the needs for chemicals uh, for the US, that's met by having already in place a trade deal with uh, the UK. They get their food stuff from Mexico and from Canada. They get their machines from China. They get their metals from China. They get their minerals from Saudi Arabia, uh, textiles from China and textiles from Mexico. But the, the game start is the same as Watch the Sky's Light, which means that you're free to make these extra trade deals. Um, so reducing time consumption really is about modeling this in a way so that people can have fun with it without having to spend a bunch of time on it. Um, this also gives us a chance to see how the world uh, functions from your country's perspective. Um, you see that, that there is um, trade in place, there is um, probably relationships that go with this trade, et cetera, et cetera. And then we come to the other part, which was increasing agency, which is something that we failed uh, horribly with um, the first time we ran it. And number one, is more than money means involving more players. And the first run we had, the first test run we did of it, in, um, an actual run of the game, um, where it crashed horribly and we had to pause the game for 30 minutes to sort it out. Um, it, um, it means that when you think about it, uh, it, it means that you can involve more players into the economy rather than the head of state signing a paper where it says I'll get to more megabucks at each turn. You can flesh it out. You can make interesting deals with different nations. Um, and it gives a sort of world building without players having to fully understand the complexity of what the Harvard model tries to tries to achieve. But it gives you a nice sort of simple way of looking at um, how the world works which is a, a from running Watch the Skies um, online with people coming from different background um, and different uh, gaming cultures, etc. cetera. Um, you end up in a situation where not all players will have the same understanding of how the world works or how the nation that they are playing uh, works. You can have a player uh, coming from Asia who has no idea about um, sort of how the American economy works and you can have American players uh, who have no idea how the European economy works. So it reduces a lot of that sort of real world knowledge and, and some of the real world um, thresholds that, that could be in a, in a game that tries to simulate um, a real world scenario as real as it is in Watch the Skies, but you know, it's an exaggerated um, version of it. It also allows us to have trade related team goals that also increases agency. For instance, we do, we do a um, Watch the Skies with more teams than, than the out of the box uh, light version, which allows for more players, etc. cetera. Um, and as a, for instance, we, include in the briefing for Saudi Arabia that they want to um, dominate the oil market. 
that involves the entire team because that could be done through science, that could be done through diplomacy, and that could be done by military means. So it gives gives the teams something rather than global military conflict to uh, deal with, which is also a part of why I um, set up this thing. The interesting thing about uh, trying to model a trade war rather than a nuclear war. Uh, there are uh, trade block related goals. So you have like the um, uh, NAFTA, the EU, um, uh, ASEAN, uh, BRICS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So many sort of uh, conflicting parts of the world economy where some people are friends with others and others are friends with uh, their enemies, et cetera. And that gives some interesting depth to the whole thing. Um, it also gives something that I think is very important. It gives a sort of asymmetrical balance for smaller, less complex economies like um, the Brazilian economy or the um, the Ethiopian economy, which is a played nation that we're having a lot of fun with, including in, in our thing. And it goes back to a, a very sort of Swedish um, thing in the, the growing up in a social de democracy and having a... Uh, children's book cartoon that is called uh, Bamse, which is a um, um, fictional uh, talking bear that also uh, al always says that uh, if you've got enough friends, you can bring down the biggest baddies. Um, and that is really, uh, if you look at the um, the US trade war that you have in front of you, if the UK, Mexico, Canada, and all the others decide that the US uh, are doing bad stuff, they can take all that away from them. Uh, and they are docked eight uh, megabucks each turn. Uh, and that can lead to some uh, really interesting narrative things. What happens to the American industry when they have no longer access to Chinese uh, machines or there is no import of food, etc.? What happens to the, to the American economy? And it gives you a way of sort of weaponizing uh, the economy, which is really what I wanted to do in the first place. Uh, which also makes for sort of a wizard wheeze friendly mechanic. As this is cards, you can move them about. It's easy to to uh, to look at, and it's also um, something that uh, has a lot of room for interpretation, which is good for wizard wheezes. Um, quickly, just what's next? We're trying to um, come up with ways to get the the economy to better interact with the science game and involve those players as, as well. So building that sort of team, nice team sort of effort to work towards economic goals. I think that's my time up. So that was quite in-depth talk. I mean, I'm sure quite a little much shock as it were, but still <laughs> reacting to like all that because with my own designs with economies have been quite a struggle and that's just like how to do it properly step by step i probably have to kind of steal a whole host of information from that so you want to put your congratulations in the chat of how well that talk went and if you have any questions for johan could you put them in the questions for the speakers so we can ask them so that's a very interesting question from Oliver there, which is, can you talk about one story that happened in actual play that showed your design hitting those targets? So you mentioned how you try to balance between complexity and agency. Can you kind of say how you've seen it working in action, how you know from a game designer, from a game runner, how your design is actually doing what you should intend it to do? Yeah. Uh, I'll uh, go back to this picture because uh, trying to hit our goal with with something that takes less time, it it, it basically you can you can have a, a nice overview and then look at it and decide what to do. You can look at it with your friends or frenemies and decide what you, what to do or shout about it or that sort of stuff. Uh, it it gives you something to. Uh, rally around when you're trying to take down the US, for instance. And uh, that happened in actual play the last time we ran it. Um, 
the American economy, uh, thanks to uh, a lot of their enemies, actually tanked because people started removing these trade deals um, when the US started acting up. So that really hit the target. Uh, and it also gave um, the pluralistic goals uh, and agency to the smaller teams that usually have no chance of um well they can't nuke the us um and that's like the obvious talking point in in um what's the skies is why do some teams have nukes and others don't but um i i think that was it was nicely executed in the last run with it where they actually took down the the, the us which brings us back to, back to rubber banding, which is something that we had to do then uh, and is a nice mechanic in Watch the Skies that is out of the box, which is um, restarting a nation, uh, shuffling um, roles within the team, and then you can just reset the economy, which is a nice rubber band mechanic to have. Excellent. So moving on from Oliver's question to Alex's, with his question being, his question being about how the deals changed between kind of dual setups. So you mentioned how you, America has the deals with the UK, China, Canada, Saudi Arabia. How much did they change from the original setups? So by the end of the game, was it somewhat similar, or did they have completely different trade partners from the beginning, or did people tend to just stick with who they had, kind of just tick it and move it on with the rest of the game? Yeah, um, that is a good question. Part of the problem that we had with starting from a blank sheet of paper in the first round that went horribly wrong was that we thought that players would each turn fill their needs, which took a whole lot of time and even more admin from control. So what we start up with uh, having is this set of trade deals uh, is there for the first four turns. And it is very clear everywhere in the rules, uh, even though people don't tend to read it. And we have to remind them that after four turns, these expire. Uh, if you want to uh, extend them, you can do that. If you want to replace them, you can do that. So it gives players an out to sort of uh, try to uh, change up the status quo. Um, and I think the nice thing about this way of doing the economy is that players who would like to engage in it can. Um, and it gives them a lot of agency when they do so. Um, but it also allows players who don't give a rat's ass to not engage in it and sort of do a minimum effort and then not change as much. So it's all it's all up to players how much they want to engage with it, change it up, use it as sort of to weaponize it. Um, so how much it changed from the original setup? Quite a bit, because like I said, we managed to miss our target quite spectacularly. Uh, but um, once it once it's there, it's being used for, for players to to do pretty much what I intended. Players never do exactly what you intend them to do, but that's part of it. So one last question from Jerry. So if anyone has any other questions, can you hit them in now before? We move on. But Jerry's question is about how do you deal with players that are doing their best to unbalance the game, which might not be as much connected with the set for Watch the Skies than before some of the other games you've ran, where that economy balancing can much more easily be tipped over into a way that you need to rubber band and directly control intervene. Yeah. Um, the, the first things. Uh first thing that players are trying to do with this economy module is go around it and trade with uh, non-played nations because it's easier than um, they find it to be easier than doing actual diplomacy uh, and we allow that but it, we make it so that it is very very expensive so for instance it would require like an agent action and a bunch of money to do it so it'll cost you more than more than um, it would engaging with other players to do it, but it gives the US a chance to get out of a trade war while, while by going to non-played nations. Um, but then would they would then have to spend like the equivalent of 
of what they would lose uh, in order to stay in business, so to speak, or probably more. Uh, but it would uh, that it would um, sort of block any unwanted narrative effects like um, strikes or uh, stuff like that. Um, the the other thing about um, in a sort of broader perspective, uh, players who are there to, to try and disrupt the game, this gives a pretty solid framework where you sort of can't do it. Um, people, the second most common question is how can we double our uh, production of textiles so we can sell textiles to more people? And the simple answer to that would be a narrative one, and, and um, Ed Silverstone is, is a master of that. Uh, but uh, it would be uh, maybe saying that if you can, if China can commandeer like 500,000 people uh, into factories, you maybe use the militaries for that, then sure. And that, that gives a sort of, it's an exaggerated example, but you, you sort of get where I'm going with it. You can, but it will cost you. That is, that is sort of the, the way we try to deal with it. Yeah, and, not, um, and not have a mechanic that breaks from mechanical from a mechanical perspective. I remember when the both run to create traders with NPCs or add extra production onto their trade board, which was a very interesting way to kind of resolve on our end, as you've made a very nice balanced economy and they were trying to break it. So unless anyone has any final quick questions on a throw in, I will pass the hat over to Rose 